Good morning. morning. Good to see you on Memorial Day weekend. Some people are probably out at their cabins right now. I know my husband is. <laughs> so this morning, I'm going to give a talk that I've titled, It Is What It Is. And I don't know if you're familiar with that phrase, it is what it is. I seem to have heard it more often in like the last five years. I know it's, it's you know, goes back farther than that. But it's just this phrase that, that I hear people say, it is what it is. It is what it is. And rather than tell you my impression of what that means, which I will tell you as we get toward the end of the talk, I thought I would look at the dictionary definition. And there is one, which kind of surprised me. It's been around that long. So the Cambridge English Dictionary has a definition for it is what it is, and it has a couple examples. So it is what it is, is a phrase that's used to say that a situation cannot be changed and must be accepted. And then the examples they give is, we're all imperfect human beings in an imperfect world. It is what it is. And asked if he was disappointed, he said, it is what it is. I'm a big believer that when one door closes, another door opens. Now, you might hear, it is what it is, and it might kind of sound to you like, hey, that's kind of like a Zen teaching. It is what it is. It's the way that things are. You think about um, this reality, and teachings that you encounter here in Buddhism and Zen that help you to see that this right here, as it is, this can't be any different than it is right now. It can't be. How could it be right now? And people think, well, it could be other, how could it be any other way than it is right now? It just is this way. And in fact, in, in Jed Larson's The Way of Zen class, or the Way, See Way Seeking Mind class, sorry, he, uh, he had a teaching from Suzuki where Suzuki was saying that things are as they should be, which doesn't mean that they should be because they shouldn't be some other way. They should be because they can't be any other way. They should be this way because this is the way they are, if that makes sense. Just this right now. And that sounds like it is what it is. It's right here. Whether we like it or not, here's the way that things are. And we also know from Zen and Buddhist teachings. Not only here it is, and it might not be something we like, but that's just the way it is. It is what it is. But Zen teaching is also to accept that, to live with that, not to reject that. So it can have that sound to it. It is what it is. Oh yeah, that's a Zen teaching. But to my ear, I don't quite hear it is what it is as pointing out the same thing that Zen and Buddhist teachings point out. To my ear, they just, they don't sound the same. And so that's what my talk is actually going to be about is, it is what it is. It's a gesture we make in our culture. But what is it that we're doing when we say it is what it is? And how is it different from Buddhist and Zen teachings that sound like they're saying the same thing? I especially think <laughs> when we get to what accepting this moment is that we have two different inflections there that will help us to see the distinction between the two. So with Buddhist teaching, Zen teaching, like I said, you may have encountered this teaching that morality is thus, can't be any other way. And what we usually do in life is we try to preserve Thus, it's not really thus we're preserving, but there might be something that's happening that we say, oh, I like that. I want to hang on to that. We might want to hang on to it, or we might say, I don't like that one particularly well. And so our usual way is to try to manipulate the situation so that it's more to our liking, so that it's not so bad. And it might be something like, it's an example I, I give. It can, it can also lead us to this idea of just really, truly accepting things as they are. But if you're outdoors and you didn't bring an umbrella or a raincoat, perhaps because your weather app didn't tell you that it was going to rain, 
which means you don't have the one that Steve Hagen has, which is one of the most detailed weather apps. Actually, you have another one now, don't you, Steve? <laughs> Two weather apps. And even then, it probably catches you by surprise sometimes. So you're out, you're out going for a walk, and suddenly the rain starts. And then a bunch of stuff happens, right? So it might be you just look around for some place you can run for cover. You know, oh, there's a tree over there. That's usually my first go-to. Now, they say in a thunderstorm, don't run under a tree, but if it's just raining, run under a tree. <laughs> so you run under a tree, and you, you probably have also had this experience if you'd done this, not all trees are equal opportunity rain stoppers. So you get under there, and then suddenly you realize you're still getting wet. And then maybe you have, I don't know, a magazine or a book you brought you know, it's starting to get wet anyhow so you just hold that over your head maybe that'll keep it and it just that just gets soaking wet and then you just realize you're going to get wet <laughs> and that's it and then you accept what it is that's showing up and like i said so we see what we usually do which is try to control the situation make it to our liking not saying when it's raining out don't run under a tree i'm just saying notice what we do and there's there will always be a point inexperience at some point in our lives when you realize there's no place for you to go there's no tree for you to hide under there's no magazine or newspaper for you to hide under there's just getting wet and there you go and that is living this that's not necessarily it is what it is now it could be it depends on how it is you're allowing yourself to get wet but i remember seeing a guy walking down the street once and it was really raining <laughs> and his whole body posture was one of complete relaxation he's just like yep <laughs> this is it you know and it was just a true genuine acceptance of the fact that he was getting sopping wet so suzuki shunryu suzuki who's a, a japanese zen teacher from the 20th century he started the san francisco zen center and uh He's a great teacher, author of a book, several books actually that uh, came from his talks. And one of them is Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, which is a classic book, excellent book. Shunryu Suzuki's got a phrase, he calls it things as it is. So we have our colloquial saying, it is what it is. Then we have Suzuki, he's got something he calls things as it is. That's what he calls what's showing up. Not it is what it is, but things as it is. And it's an interesting phrase because it, it catches our ear. Things as it is. Shouldn't it be things as they are? As they started, I think in the uh, Zen mind, beginner's mind, it might actually say things as they are. And it was, uh, I remember reading uh, Edward S.P. Brown's introduction to the second collection of Suzuki's talks called Not Always So where he talked about this phrase, things as it is. And he said, Suzuki would use that phrase all the time, things as it is. And yes, English was not his first language. And he did make many, you know, grammatical kind of gaffes. But this one was always consistently used. And we can think things as it is, as a pointing, as a teaching. Things as it is, what what uh, Suzuki is helping us to see is all beings are expressing this one reality. Things as it is, all beings are expressing this one reality. Each thing that we encounter, each thing that, each object that appears to us is the whole universe showing up as that object. Whatever it is, it's actually just this experience is the whole universe showing up as this experience, whatever it might be. And it could be this experience is me looking at this cup. It could be you listening to this talk. It could be you daydreaming. The whole universe is showing up as that. All beings expressing one reality. All beings. So totality expressing as this one reality and showing up as these myriad things. That's how it shows up. That's things as it is. That's what Suzuki is capturing, is that these things are expressing this one reality. So things as it is. He's helping us to see in this teaching how it is we usually just get caught up in the things. 
the myriad things. That's where we get caught. We take these things to have a reality and a truth to them that they don't have. We impose that on them. They never promised us that they're, <laughs> that they're expressing the kind of truth that we insist that they do. But we uh, impose this truth. So a lot of teachings you'll get. Somebody asked Suzuki this at one point in his teachings. A lot of the teachings you'll hear in Zen are about how this is one reality that's expressing. That this is totality. This is the one mind that's expressing as such. And somebody asked Suzuki, they said, well, there are these things that are showing up. We need to respect these things. Why do you keep stressing emptiness and the oneness of everything? And Suzuki said, well, that's because that's where you're confused. <laughs> that's the thing we need to keep reminding you of. So I've noticed, and I, I think I was like this when I first started too, I would hear teachings on the fact that, you know, things as it is, and that it's helping us to see how these seemingly separate things are actually expressing a seamless whole a totality that doesn't have any edges or doesn't necessarily have any separate things to it. And I would go, yeah, but, you know, but here this stuff is. And the way that I would do that is to think, well, it's not all just emptiness. You know, it's not what it is. And what I was doing there, and I hear, I can hear people do this from time to time, is they're putting the thingness back because in their mind, the thingness that we seem to encounter with every day, and I'm just hitting this stuff because that's the easiest way to get it. But it could be anything, it, you know, whatever it is, or how you feel about a situation. That's the stuff that we know in our heart of hearts that's real. So when we have a teacher and they're pointing out the emptiness, the oneness of everything, the fact that things aren't substantial, we know in our heart of hearts that that's not really what's really taking place. This is what's really taking place. I got to go drive my car somewhere. I got a job. I got, you know, you'll hear that tossed out then when a teacher is pointing out the oneness of everything, how everything is actually harmoniously working together. Harmoniously working together. What about that jerk over there? Right. And so we always come back to the things because that's where we're stuck. We're actually not hearing the teacher. We're not hearing and to be honest, tasting this aspect of reality. We actually always are tasting the fact that reality is a seamless whole. It's just the flavor of thus, of things as it is. That's just the nature of it. Well, we don't realize what we're tasting. So what we do is we'll hear that teaching and it's hard for us to wrap our heads around it because it's impossible for us to wrap our heads around. That's why it's hard for us to wrap our heads around. So we're like in the, maybe in the back of our minds, trying to wrap our heads around it. We can't quite get it. It doesn't quite seem real to us. So we know this is the real stuff. I got to go in that world. So la-di-da with your oneness. I mean, I don't want to overplay that, but I do hear versions of this from people all the time. And it always comes back to, but there are these separate distinctions. Well, sure, we see them all the time. Here they are showing up. But this is where we get caught. This is where we think this is the end. This is the beginning and the end of it all. Oh, yeah, I hear emptiness, whatever, oneness. Okay, I get that. But there still are these distinctions. And there we are. We're actually still there with the things. So things as it in things as it is, again, as a teaching, is just to help us to open up that, to realize that the separate individual seeming things isn't the whole picture. It's not the end of the story, so to speak. And I think you can already start to hear how the end of the story and it is what it is are kind of connected to one another. End of the story. This is it is what it is. But just to clarify a little bit more about this, uh, things as it is, and the fact that um, the, 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 what it is that Suzuki's pointing out, I thought I'd read a passage from a book. And one of the things that Suzuki is going to point out, it's actually a, a selection from a teaching that Suzuki did on a, uh, a well-known Buddhist text, Sandakai, Zen text, actually, a poem. 
a poem that Suzuki has given many lectures on and rightfully pointed out as one of the great teachings. And um, in this, he helps us to see that things as it is, is not always this way, but it is always thus. It's not always this way, but it is always thus. It's not always this particular way. And in fact, it's not any particular way. That's what things as it is helps us to see. So here's Suzuki. He says, you may have a special experience and think, this is it. This is how it should be. If someone opposes you, you will be angry. No, it should be like this, not like that. Zen center should be like this. Maybe so. But it is not always so. If times change and we lose Tassajara, and Tassajara was the uh, monastery that Suzuki founded in the mountains south of San Francisco. He said, uh, if times change and we lose Tassajara and move to another mountain, the way we have here cannot be the same way we will have there. So without sticking to some particular way, we open our minds to observe things as it is and to accept things as it is. Without this basis, when you say, this is the mountain, or this is my friend, or this is the moon, the mountain will not be the mountain. My friend will not be my friend, and the moon will not be the moon itself. That is the difference between sticking to something and Buddha's way. So go back to the beginning of this and go, go through this a little bit. So Suzuki says, you may have a special experience and say, this is it. This is how it should be. And I would even say, this is how it should be. That part might be unspoken. We might just go, well, this is it. This is how it is. This is how it is. Now, along with that is if this is how it is, this is the way it should be. So that if it's some other way, then we resist that. Well, that's not, that's not how we do it. That's not how it is. And I think we can all think of experiences we have where we, things are either done a certain way or things always showed up a certain way and suddenly it's not that way. Maybe a friend who's always seemingly sunny and cheery and then we meet them one day and they look really bummed out. But this isn't how it is. This isn't it. Or uh, um, I'm just trying to think if this is an example of it. Uh, but, you know, like kids might want to... Uh, take a, a car ride. And one of them always sits on one side of the car. <laughs> and then the one of the kids, maybe to be provocative, takes the side that the one kid always sits on. And then there's a fight because that's not how it is. That's not how it is. So, so we can get upset about this. And especially when you're talking about something like Zen practice you know, or religious practice, but you think about Zen and how we do it here at Dharma Field. So You've come here, you see how people do it here, and you might go to another center and then people are doing it differently. You go, that's not, that's not how you do it. Or vice versa, somebody comes to Dharma Field and they look and they go, wait a minute, what is that thing? <laughs> that's, that's not the Buddha. What are you doing here? This isn't how you do that. So you can see how you can grab ideas about how it is just by you have this experience and you go, okay, this is how things are. And then when it's some other way, it distresses us. But as Suzuki said, these things we do, you know, maybe doing something a particular way is the right way to do it. Maybe not. Depends on the situation. Depends on the context, the way in which things are unfolding right now. So if we have a way of doing things, and then the situation changes, but we keep insisting on doing it that way, well, mischief can follow. To put it mildly, I always think of uh, uh, one of Shakespeare's late plays. The title of the play is Coriolanus. Set in Rome, there's this uh, Roman general. His name is Caius Martius, at least in Shakespeare's play. Caius Martius was a great general. He was a great general. And there was an uprising in Rome. And he... Quelled it. Actually, I think this was still a war. I don't even think this was an uprising. 
where he got his name from, Coriolanus. It looked like Rome was going to lose this battle. And Coriolanus or Caius Martius threw himself in the battle. It's really a, a horrifying and tremendous image in Shakespeare's play where Caius Martius throws himself into the, the enemy horde. And then you think he's going to die. Well, of course, we know better because it's act one. <laughs> he's not going to die now. But he comes out covered. This is the image in Shakespeare's play, covered from head to toe in blood. The blood of his enemies. He just kills them. They win. Rome is triumphant. Rome's no longer at war. And Coriolanus, he gets that name, Coriolanus. It's like the blood was a baptism, and his baptismal, ba baptismal name is Coriolanus, named after the place where this battle took place. Coriolanus now, he's in this, you know, Richard III is a little bit like this too, but here he is, and now it's peace. And people want him to be a politician. They want him to enter politics, to serve Rome that way. And he can't, he can't do it. It's so against his idea of who he is, what politics are. What we think politics are, that's in Shakespeare's play. <laughs> all that power struggle and that lying and duplicity and this, that, and the other manipulation, all of that. And Coriolanus was just a very straightforward, this is right and this is wrong, and I'll protect what's wrong and I'll do what's right. And usually I was just, I'll quash my enemies with my sword. So when he is asked to be in politics, he can't quite handle it. And that's when the civil unrest happens in Rome. And you know, I'm telling you all of this because he actually starts to cause a civil war in Rome because he can't change to the times. He's carrying the general with him, and the general's completely out of season with what's taking place in Rome at the time. That, those are the kind of devastating you know, occurrences say sequences, but the consequences of not living with the times. They don't have to be so kind of catastrophic and just be, we're just doing the same thing and it's just not appropriate. <laughs> it's not going to work or it's going to disturb people. So as Suzuki says, so without sticking to some particular way, we open our minds. So we don't stick to this particular way. It's not always like this. Instead, we observe things as it is. How is it right now? What's showing up? Things as it is. And accept things as it is. To observe things as it is, is to accept things as it is. You see that? So rather than thinking that things are the way that they should be, the way that I imagine them to be, you actually let that go and you just observe things as it is. And to observe things as it is, is to allow things to be as it is, which is to accept things as it is. He says, without that basis, Suzuki, without that, just observing things as it is, and in observing things as it is, accepting things as it is, without that basis, he says, when you say, this is the mountain, or this is my friend, or this is the moon, the mountain will not be the mountain. My friend will not be my friend, and the moon will not be the moon itself. Why? because it's just going to be our idea of what the mountain is. It's just going to be our idea of what my friend is. It just be an idea of what the moon is. We're not allowing it to be what it is. We're not allowing things as it is. We're not accepting things as it is. So getting back to it is what it is, to my ear, it is what it is. Get stuck on it. It gets stuck on particularly, uh, uh, it gets st stuck on particularity, excuse me. So rather than just observing things as it is, it has an idea about how things are. Or to give you that example from the Cambridge English Dictionary, we're all imperfect human beings in an imperfect world. It is what it is. <laughs> you know, it's an idea. So we get stuck on the particularity and then we accept it. That's it is what it is, is accepting the idea we have about something. So I'm going to just really quickly look at these differences in acceptance to help you see again the distinction between those. So remember, 
that things as it is just accepts thus. It accepts thus, as opposed to this particular way, it accepts thus. And the difference is that, again, that thus is not any particular way. It's just thus. So thus is always thus. It's always, and thus is just a, a way we talk about just now. It's just but now. It's un, not, now. I don't, I don't even want to say more than that. It's just now. Experiencing now. And that may look different from moment to moment. In fact, my guess is that it's always different from moment to moment. If you're paying attention, you'll realize my fingers are far colder right now <laughs> than when I walk into the room. And in that way, it's different. But there's also having talked so far and looked at my notes and got lost in Coriolanus. For, you know, there are things that have happened. Everything is different. So from moment to moment, things look, don't look the same. It's not always so. That's what Suzuki said before. He says, um, you know, Zen center should be like this. He says, maybe so, but it is not always so. And I know I've offered this teaching before, but I always like it. And Suzuki said, I have this teaching about things as it is. Two words, not always so. And there's, of course, laughter because it's three words. And then he said, well, in Japanese, two words. That's the teaching of not always so. In Japanese, two words. In English, three words. But not always so. But it's always thus. So the acceptance, then, is of thus. And again, thus can show up any way. Shows up no particular way. There's our appearance is a trouble, but thus does not have any particular appearance. It is what it is, except this particular thing. And that, again, is the idea we have of what it is. So, again, it's uh, we're all imperfect human beings in an imperfect world. It is what it is. Or in the other one, asked if he was disappointed, he said, it is what it is. I'm a big believer that when one door closes, another one opens. And you go, well, there's change in that. But if you look at what he's saying, it's like it should be a way. It should be a particular way. The way it's going, kind of disappointing. But hey, that's what it, it is what it is. So it is what it is. The idea of acceptance there is that there's a particular thing that is being accepted. With things as it is, there is no particular thing to accept. So it is what it is, is there's a thing there, and it might reek to high heaven for us. <laughs> that might be the way we think of it. And so to accept it is to, you can almost hear the teeth gritting. Eh, it is what it is. Or I'm going to suggest another gesture, which is a shrug of the shoulders and what that seems to signify. But it, it is, there's something out there and you have to put up with it, or you have to just accept this is the way it is. Whereas things as it is. There's no particular thing to accept. It's just observing things as it is. It's not trying to shut anything out. That's realizing that there actually isn't anything to shut out. There's just this as it's showing up. So accepting it is what it is, is to say that it can't be any different than it is right now. Um, I'm sorry, that Things as it is, is things are, I can't be any different right now, but again, there's nothing there to accept. There is accepting it is what it is, is to say it can't be any different than it is right now. And now oh, this is the way it is, you know, this particular way is the way it is. So there's this thing, and in my ear, anyhow, it is what it is, the way it's usually spoken, is we wish it were different, but it is what it is. It is what it is. And we have to put up with it. So it's a difference. If I'd seen that guy walking out in the rain and his body was still kind of rigid and he's just so, that'd be one thing. But there was just a oneness with being wet, a oneness with that rain that is not a just gritting your teeth or putting up with it. Or, as I said, saying it is what it is to me seems like it's a kind of a shrugging as eh, it is what it is. And in doing that, the triggering the shoulders, kind of a dismissal of what's taken place. That is what it is. End of engagement. 
It's an end of an engagement. So I was amused when, you know, I'd been hearing the saying for a while and it was, I was thinking to my crawl a little bit when I would hear it, you know, and I'd go, well, watch that, Steve. <laughs> you don't have to, it doesn't have to bother you. Things bother me like that sometimes. So, you know, I was just watching a movie once. Well, that, that's probably not a surprise, but it was uh, Martin Scorsese's movie, The Irishman. I don't know if people saw that, but it's about Jimmy Hoffa and about uh, uh, his friend who was a mobster. And really, it was a, it's an interesting film. And uh, what, I, what I realized is when somebody had a contract on them, when they were going to get rubbed out in, you know, gangster lingo, they would say, it's what it is. <laughs> you know, it was like, that's what they said to say, end of story. And I think that's what it is, what it is also signifies when we say it. End of story, end of engagement it is what it is. Let's move on. That's done. And yet, things as it is, it's always engagement. Every moment is engagement. Nothing gone, nothing really here. It's just thus. It's just this, things as it is. All of the universe showing up as this. Not this particular thing, but just this present moment. So I don't know if I want to put a cap on it. It is what it is, right? <laughs> but when we, when we hear that, just think about what's at the heart of that. It is what it is. And how it's caught up in a particular perspective, a particular way of interpreting reality, and how it is used to then dismiss the thing you don't want. Eh, it is what it is. And how human it is to want to diminish and dismiss the things that hurt us, the things that make us uncomfortable. And we can hear in that the cries of the world. We can hear in that suffering. And in that is Buddhist compassion. And hearing that, when we hear somebody say it is what it is, we are actually being observing things as it is and accepting things as it is. So those are my prepared comments for today. Do people have uh, comments or questions? Yeah, Steve. It was sort of woven into what you've been saying, or what I did here, but I've caught myself uh, recently, maybe it's because the phrase is becoming more common, but I've used it a bit <laughs> on occasions. And uh, but what I feel I'm expressing is my own ignorance. I don't know what it is. No. But it is what it is, yeah. whatever it is, I, but I don't know. So it's like, um, uh, in, a, in a sense, it's like I have nothing to say, but maybe the immediate circumstance calls me out to say something. So I might use that phrase. But in my mind, it's like um, a third option to the two that you, you had there that I'm just expressing, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, know what this is. So, yeah. I, I, but here it is. Yeah, yeah, no, I hadn't given that reading, but that is a, an excellent reading. Um, and it does say one thing about it is what it is. So we want, again, to just really pay attention to what somebody's saying. So if you hear Steve use it, and I'm not saying every time you use it, you're going to use it the way you just described. Well, I think I, I, think I will. <laughs> <laughs> I do. You know, but, if, but if we're attentive, the words themselves, this is very important. Words themselves never are that important. I mean, they are important, but the intention behind the words is always more important. And you can hear that as well. This is something that actors know. You get a word like hark. <laughs> you know, you're just thinking if you're in a Shakespeare play, hark, you know, and how do you say it? You go, or is it hark? Or is it hark? You know, I mean, you can say it any number of ways. What's the intention behind it? That's what drives the language that we speak. So that phrase in and of itself, I guess, 
I was trying to talk about the way I heard it intended, and I hadn't even thought about thinking of it as it is what it is as an expression of, in a way of it's the way that it's tautological like that, that it refers back to itself, that it's just something you can't say something about, that you can't make some kind of statement about, and it allows it its own things as it isness in a manner of speaking. So, yeah. So thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, you're gonna get a microphone there. Yeah, there you go. You just hang on to it. You don't have to do anything fancy. <laughs> if you just speak, they'll hear. Yep, just thought. Oh, um, uh, the word it, uh, we tend to reify it into a thing, and it's a very different thing for whatever in the negative things, uh, you know, like a, a disaster. Um, uh, but it uh, the mind is apt to realize that it's a little more nebulous than an identifiable thing. Uh, it's a, maybe a feeling of apprehension about uh, a death in the family or something like that. Yeah. Um, all right, it was just the, the word it is a kind of a pitfall. Yeah. 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 Thanks for sharing. Right. Especially when something is difficult for us. And I think, again, it is what it is, is kind of pointing to things that are potentially difficult or troublesome for us. So it's just, it is what it is, you know. Um, but those difficult things, they can seem insurmountably difficult for us when we make it's out of them, when we don't see that they don't have that kind of substance that we usually give them everything if we just allow it to time everything that shows up fades away so these seemingly insurmountable events are just the way we framed experience that event may have shown up a loved one may have died right but there's just so much more to what is showing up than that i mean it will that pain is there it's very real we live that pain but that pain isn't so real that that's the way it is. I mean, it is the way it is as you're tasting that pain. And as you're not, as you're tasting something else, that is what's showing up as well. But it's in those difficult times when those it's seem just so solid and like mountains that we can't overcome. So thanks for sharing. Yeah, David. The way I have heard that phrase used seems to me to be often, you could have done that better, but it is what it is. Or I could have done it better, so it is what it is. Or, you know, I better accept it, or you'd better accept it. <laughs> right. Yeah, so it still has that flavor to it of something's not right, something's not quite acceptable. But we're going to have to accept it. <laughs> it's, you know, it's just the way it is. You went ahead and I don't know what you did. Put the think about the way my stepdad used to repair the house. I, God bless him, he uh, he tried. <laughs> but you know, you you uh, probably remember a Red Green show where he used duct tape to fix everything. My stepdad used electrical tape to fix everything. You know, and it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions or comments? And remind me your name again. Sumed. Sumed. And and so as I was listening to your talk, I, I kept thinking of it is what it is, is a, is a way to put a certain situation in a box yeah. and then move it to the side. And then as I continue to listen, I'm, I'm listening about, uh, I can't recall the alternative, always or what that Zen master was saying, the alternative saying. Yeah. And I'm hearing you talk about thusness, and I'm trying to capture the alternative way yeah. to it is what it is. And the words that are coming to mind are allowance and openness. But I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more on the alternative path to putting something in a box and setting it to the side. Yeah. 
I will. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, the, well, the first thing you're, you're, it was interesting when you were saying it, it was almost like you wanted another box to put that in so that you could put it in another box and then put that away. And that's what the alternative really is to not do that hmm. is to, you know, it's things as it is. It's to accept things it is, as it is. But as I was saying in my talk, to accept things as it is, is to truly just be attentive to things as it is, hmm. as opposed to our idea about things as it is. So there is an openness to it. There is allowance to it. But if that's the way we think of it, then we put it in a box again. And so a situation may arise where something that looks like openness isn't the appropriate response to make. And we go, oh, but things as it is, is openness. And it doesn't really quite fit that. But things as it is, is a radical kind of openness that doesn't really settle anywhere. So you're right. I, I, the way that I usually hear it is, you know, things, it is as it is, or what is it saying again? It's, 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 uh, it's the way it is. It is the way it is. Uh, the way I usually hear that is people putting it in a box and they're just putting it away. Like, yes, that job was, that is what it is. Put it in a box and put it away. And there's a, there can be some kind of scolding in there. But the other method is just not to do that. It's just to always, it is what it is, I suppose, in a manner of speaking. Here it is. So what is it? So that, that you know, interrogative thinking of the openness you're talking about that just sort of like really ask yourself what is it because that's the thing we've we usually settle what it is pretty fast again it's a it's a characteristic of being human you you already have the situation you walk into a room you, you step outside it's all settled <laughs> and you have ideas about is this good or is this bad just by looking and uh, and so then it's settled, then it's put in a box, and then we can do with whatever we want to do with the box. But things as it is, is to maybe notice you, you want to do that, and you want to put it in a box, and that's what's showing up right now, too. So just notice that, and then let what it is that's showing up fully blossom. So does that help? Yeah. Yeah, good. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? It was a great discussion. You got something online? No? All right. Well, great. Thank you all for being here this morning. Thank you. Thank you.